Awesome. So I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I absolutely love this the learning health system framework because I think it really perfectly encapsulates what we've been talking about from the beginning in, in Middlesex London. And I know it's been happening within a lot of other Ontario health teams. So uh, what I thought I would do today is take the opportunity to just really walk us through the journey. So take us back to sort of step one. Uh, and, and that journey is certainly far from complete, but to kind of give you a sense for what we've been thinking about. And again, how much I think it aligns with uh, what we've seen in this this framework. In the, the very brief time I have today, this is what I thought we would do. First, orient everyone to Middlesex London and our philosophy, uh, but then really just go back to the beginning and give an illustration of how we've used population health data from the beginning, uh, illustrate some of the key insights we've taken from that information. But then I think just as importantly, and one of the things I was really happy to see within the, the framework that's been proposed is that when we talk about data, it's not just numbers, it's qualitative information as well. <clears throat> One of the terms that we've heard a lot in ROHT and seems to be popping up frequently is that we are data rich and information poor. And we've certainly acknowledged from the beginning that although we have wonderful data for holdings to draw on, the con context that comes from qualitative information and conversations is really important subset of that. So we don't wanna lose sight of that. This is our purpose statement that we've created in Middlesex London. The reason why I wanted to start here is that we try to ground all of the work we're doing within this purpose statement of improving our healthcare experience together, where people are heard, care is connected, and whole health is possible for everyone. And you'll see this was developed in a co-design process, through a co-design process with patients, caregivers, providers, executives from across the system. And what you'll see in the words under, under some of the terminology there are elements of the quintuple aim, elements of integrated care, certainly elements of population health management. So we've been trying very actively from the beginning to be thinking about how we incorporate and embed those concepts in everything that we do. I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly and part of why the formatting has changed is these are the actual slides that we used in 2019 when we were walking our uh, then Western OHT coordinating council through what data we had available to inform the planning and thinking around Ontario health teams. So as Walter mentioned, in the early days, we dove very heavily into the Ministry of Health data that was provided to us. And so um, we were you know, really fortunate, again, speaking to the fact that we have wonderful data holdings. We got some data, we were able to present on the fact that we had 514,024 people that we were to support. We had some breakdown that helped us to understand demographics from an age perspective, where they lived, how many were urban versus rural, some information about language, certainly visible minorities. So you can, I'm not going to go through all the, the numbers in detail, but you can see we were fortunate to be able to share that information early on. We also acknowledged early that we needed to supplement that information. One really key piece that has come out consistently is that we don't have fantastic information on our Indigenous populations. We were very fortunate in our area that we had just had uh, our SOHAC, um, our regional AHAC, had just completed a survey of local uh, Indigenous communities. And so we were able to draw on some of that and share that information um, with our coordinating council early on to acknowledge the importance of this information. Um, <clears throat> what we also tried to do is dive a little bit more deeply into uh, what we thought we could we could move on in the early days. So what were we starting to see in terms of trends and or opportunities? So very early on, we did identify that COPD and heart failure were fairly significant um, uh, conditions, uh, challenges being faced by our population, um, and, and able to work with our partners to start thinking about, you know, how many bed days were being occupied. ALC is information that we consistently look at. So again, you can start to see across the continuum, we were trying to draw on what resources we had to paint the picture of how our system was functioning. And really, to be honest, to the, one of the benefits of OHTs is that we had members of inpatient, our inpatient rehab community, our long-term care community, our community support services at the table. So some of this journey early days was just orienting people to the kinds of data that we have across the system that they would not necessarily have uh, seen. We also really wanted to make sure that we were incorporating the cost data. So this, again, was part of the package that, that we would have received as one of those early Ontario health teams, and I think others have, see, have received as well. And so we wanted to start looking through this information to start to share with people 
which were the groups that were driving uh, the highest cost. And that's a very common population health management approach. And we were, again, really happy to see some of this included in some of those early packages. And it's something that we have to continue to keep our eyes on. But you'll see on the right-hand side, one of the things that really jumped out at us is that when you look at the HPGs that were driving our cost, eight out of the 10 were with significant comorbidities. And of course, that didn't come as a surprise to anybody, but it was great to have the data to validate what people were saying at the table. We also uh, you know, went in and had the, the fortune, as many others have, of partnering with, with others and, and looking at what other data systems do we have access to. So it, as early as 2019, we were already partnering strongly with uh, IDS. And so we were able to, to access some of that information through our, our London Health Sciences data support or decision support department. So they were able to pull some of this together again to give us more of a local context around you know, how many patients are we seeing? What are those conservable bed days? Where are the opportunities and where do they lie? And, and to illustrate what information we had access to. I will say, you know, one of the things we found in that early exercise, though, was um, when we went across some of these different partners and started looking at what data they had access to, something that consistently came up was that the data polls would be inconsistent. So the numbers were inconsistent. And the data scientists would know why that happens. Um, but it's really difficult to communicate to your partners in the system why we can't get the number to be the same across different data holdings, data sources. And so it became a really important source of conversation as we were thinking about how we're going to go forward and using data to inform our thinking. So here are the key lessons I would say when we when we're really kind of reflecting and thinking back to those early days. So one is we said over and over and over and over again, 514,024 to the point where it became almost a joke within our, our OHT. Um, and then, and as we know, our, our attributed populations have shifted. So as that number has shifted, we've said other numbers as well. But we did that intentionally because right from the beginning, we wanted everyone to understand that if we're going to drive population health management, we need to acknowledge that those 514,024 people are people. And we need to start to get to the point where we're not creating just creating aggregate reports. We're starting to understand who they are at an individual level, what they need, and then designing the system to proactively connect to them. It's been a really important message from the beginning. And I would say uh, at the, in the early days, it seemed like it, we'd never get there. And then I think you're going to see here some presentations today that are going to show how we're actually starting to, to understand how we're going to do that. So that to me is really exciting. The other piece that really I reflected on having a chance to look at this was we, when we were looking through some of those data holdings, we had things like um, COPD as an example. The number that was given to us in that ministry data was 6,389 people. But when we looked at population-based prevalence estimates, those would suggest that within our attributed population, we should actually see more like 30,000 people. And the same is true for congestive heart failure. We really are, the, the data was suggesting we're reporting about half of what we would expect to see from a population-based estimate. And it was a really important conversation, both at the coordinating council, but as we went out and started to reach out to partners, that, that information allowed us to start talking to people about who are we missing in these data holdings. Um, and I'll say one of the most powerful conversations we had early days was when we went and met with some partners from our heart failure clinic, who are by far the local experts in management of heart failure and have been you know, actively involved in driving best practice deck recommendations, just a fantastic team. But when we met with them and talked to them about what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, they said, we said, how many patients are you supporting? And they said, well, about 500 at a time. It was that 10,000 number that allowed us to say, so who's supporting the other 9,500? And I think it was a bit of a turning point. Um, those kinds of conversations were turning points to getting people to stop just thinking about existing programs and start thinking population. It was a huge piece for us. And we continue to have those conversations. And I'll say one of the things that's really exciting in some of the more recent data holdings that we're getting access to is we're starting to see some of those prevalence estimates come out. So we're getting a more accurate picture of our actual attributed population. Um, the last point I wanted to make is um, there, there's also, as we've been exploring this, one of the key things is that we've been 
starting to be aware, more aware of the data that we don't have access to. And a great example of that is we've consistently talked about the people who are unattached to primary care within our OHT. And we have an estimate of about 65,000. And the comment that we've been making consistently is it's, it's unfortunate that that's just an estimate. We need to get to the point where we know who those people are by name so we can proactively connect with them and support them. So again, speaking to opportunities that we're now as OHT starting to hear whispers of, you know, maybe we will actually be able to get the names of some of those people to be able to work within those data holders. So in kind of the last couple of minutes here, that's a way, the way that we've we sort of looked at data early and how we've been on that same journey of really using it to ask questions within our OHT. But as I mentioned, what's been really important is we've been acknowledging that we need to supplement those numbers with other pieces of information. So we've done that in a couple of ways. Even in the early, early days, we acknowledge that we cannot pick a priority population strictly based on data. So the exercise that we undertook is we actually went out to our partners and said, you tell us what you think are the most burning priority populations that we should be focusing on. And we grounded that in concepts of change management, like which ones are we really able to support? Can we do something about but which ones are also uh, kind of uh, the most pressing challenges that you're feeling on the ground. But what was really interesting in that was through that, we had seven population suggestions that come, came forward. One was very distinct. It was uh, parents of infants uh, do, that were supporting them in the early um, early phases of life. We supported that group to go and actually speak with another OHT that was developing around pediatrics. But the other six populations that were recommended were a variation of COPD, CHF, people needing support, transitioning across care, um, people at risk of institutionalization. And when we got all of those six groups to come together into a, into a room, they actually acknowledged that they really were talking about the same people. It was a really powerful exercise. What that, um, so at the process was um, we had got people into the room and we had experts come with them uh, into the room to kind of help facilitate those conversations. But what you see at the bottom is the recommendation for our priority population. This went to our, our coordinating council. Uh, we, it, we, so we recommended through this process that our year, our, our, uh, year one priority population should be older adults with chronic conditions in need of system level care coordination and navigation. So it really was only that we were focused on subpopulations of high-risk patients with COP or CHF uh, and older adults at risk of institutionalization. But this came out of that agreement that we're all kind of talking about the same, same group of people. It's interesting over time how this has slowly shifted to our OHT is focused on COPD and CHF. But I would say within our internal conversations, we haven't lost track of the other pieces. Um, we very actively in the beginning, wanted to make sure that we were incorporating the voices of patients, clients, and care partners. So we formed a patient, client, care partner that uh, council very early. Uh, the co-chair of that council is our co-chair of our coordinating council, and we make sure that we're thoroughly using that group uh, at every step. What we did with that group is we wanted to make sure that we were thinking about a matrix so that when we went out and did experience-based co-design on with groups to try to understand what we should be doing, that we were very intentionally making sure, you can see on the left-hand side, making sure that we were proactively reaching out to different sectors of our population and getting good representation from each of those sectors. And this is an ongoing process that we continue to kind of review, uh, we, that our patient client care partner council continues to kind of think about this. And within our co-design, we continue to think about this. This is the, really the important piece is what came out of that experience-based co-design are these nine areas of focus. Uh, sorry, 10 areas of focus. And we consistently come back to these over and over again as part of our decision-making process as we think about taking on projects. So it's not just about the data. We can start with the data, but we always come back to how are we addressing one of these issues within each project. And the way we do that is through a decision-making tool. So we've established a tool that we're happy to share. I know we've shared with some OHTs and happy to share beyond. Um, that as we consider a, a project, we ask people to reflect on how is this project supporting each element of the quintuple aim, our OHT in meeting our purpose? Is it aligned with our co-design themes uh, as an example? Uh, does it support our priority population? Is it scalable? And then we've actually added in some other elements too. So we're really wanting to make sure that we're 
honoring what came out of that experience-based co-design, and this is the way that we do it. Uh, this for me was just my last kind of points around, I think if there are takeaways that I could share with the group from this process, and it's ongoing, <clears throat> is that there really is a ton that we can learn from the numbers, but there's a lot that we can also learn from the absence of numbers. And we've seen a lot and had a lot of really rich conversations when we've talked about what, what information is missing and how would we address that. Um, and then the last piece, of course, is that really making sure that we're um, embedding everything within the right context. Mm -hmm.